So welcome back to the Japan Update this year. Um, we're on to our second panel, um, Science, Defense and Technology in Japan. So uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Shiro Armstrong. I run the Australia Japan Research Center at the ANU and it's my pleasure to bring this update to you with my colleagues, Lauren Richardson and Ippe Fujiwara. Uh, before I start, let me acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and pay our respects to the elders past and present. And of course, here in Canberra, we're on Ngunnawal country. So in this session, we're bringing together uh, the digital economy, new defense issues, and the ever important energy transition that Japan has embarked, started uh, to, to transition and embarked upon. Um, <clears throat> we're bringing that, those three what seem to be disparate topics together um, in the form of thinking about Japanese innovation and Japan as a technology leader. Uh, so for this session, we've got three panelists, uh, three of them now, and then hand over to hear presentations from each. So first we have Jun Mukoyama, who's a fellow at the Asia Pacific Initiative. Um, Ms. Mukoyama holds a BA in law, political science from Keio, and a master of public administration from Harvard University's John F. Kennedy School. Uh, prior to joining the API, uh, she was 10 years in business development and investment in Mitsubishi Corporation. Uh, our second speaker will be Yuki Tatsumi, uh, a senior fellow and co-director of the East Asia program and director of the Japan program at the Stimson Center in Washington, DC. Before joining the Stimson Center, Yuki was at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, um, also at Washington, and earlier was a special assistant for political affairs at the Embassy um, of Japan in Washington. Um, many of you will know Yuki is a leading commentator and analyst on US-Japan alliance, Japan's security policy, and Japanese domestic politics and US-Asia policy. Uh, and finally, last but not least, Associate Professor Llewellyn Hughes, a, Crawford, a, a colleague of ours here at the Crawford School of Public Policy at the ANU. Llewellyn has got a PhD from MIT um, and trained in political science, but is a specialist on energy policy. So with that, uh, let me hand over first to Jun, uh, to Jun Mukoyama, to talk to us about the digital economy. Over to you, Jun. Thank you, Shiro. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Jun Mukoyama, and I'm a fellow at Asia Pacific Initiative. Um, there's been a lot of change in the past year in Japan on digital policy. So I'd like to spend a few minutes uh, talking about uh, Japan's uh, recent digital policy, so I'm gonna. So um, in context of uh, COVID-19, I was a working member of um, the Independent Investig Investigation Commission on the Japanese government's response to COVID-19, which uh, analyzed early uh, years, last year's response, uh, government's response to COVID-19. And during the interview with then health minister uh, Katsunobu Kato, he said the delay in digital transformation was the great challenge in responding to the pandemic. And what does that mean? And you might have seen these articles about Japan's fax machines. Um, so during the early stages of the pandemic, uh, Japanese government could not effectively collect information on number of patients, number of deaths, vacant beds, etc., cetera, um, because uh, information exchange was, among, uh, was based on papers. Uh, fax, fax machines were uh, used between local governments and hospitals and the central um, government. So COVID-19 response team, uh, including data scientists and epidemiologists, had uh, real difficulty uh, collecting accurate real-time data. And that, um, that has led to, to, to governments um, developing uh, many systems, but that initiative also uh, often failed. Uh, for example, uh, Hersey's Health Center real-time information sharing system was created uh, to, to resolve that such issue of using paper-based information, but it was criticized um, its poor usability and uh, the contact tracing app COCO uh, was criticized uh, that it has not been compatible with the OS updates on Android 
And these old the systems um, failed, uh, basically, uh, and uh, caused a, a vast criticism from the Japanese society. And the, I think that this was the worst one, uh, government's cash distribution operation. Um, so in response to COVID-19, um, governments uh, tried to distribute uh, cash grants to its citizens. And comparing to other countries like Germany or South Korea or the US, uh, they spend a few days uh, or at least a, a month uh, to, to, to de do this operation. But in this photo, you can see a local authorities office packed with um, people because this is um, Japanese government's uh, online application required my number card, which was uh, needed to 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 use to, to get these grants, but um, only sixty percent of uh, citizens had this my number card, and people stormed into these local offices to actually apply for the the, the card. So the the online system was built to to avoid and prevent physical contacts, but um, this didn't uh, actually uh, achieve the purpose of that. So such disastrous situation led to push for creating a new digital agency, which was launched last week. And what kind of challenges they faced? Um, I have a slide here. Um, on procurement, they had a one year budget cycle and they used uh, waterfall methodology and they had very uh, stringent uh, procurement policies which relied really on big vendors like Fujitsu and NEC or NTT data and they didn't really manage the, the system development uh, properly. And also the human resources, uh, uh, so Japan has lifetime employment uh, and most of the public servants rotate in cycle of two years so they uh, lacked expertise and didn't uh, accumulate knowledge to, to actually uh, use that kind of um, uh, expertise in the digital field. And also um, this usual silo between the ministries or the uh, segmentation between local government and central government was also a, a huge obstacle. And also use of personal information. Uh, J Japan has very strict my number law uh, which prohibited use of uh, tax, for example, tax information to, to, to distribute cash because um, there was a Supreme Court ruling that um, Jap uh, government should decentralize the use of um, the hold of personal information. So government is very um, cautious about uh, use of personal information and this has caused a lot of uh, complex operation in, in simple things like distributing cash. So the agency was launched last week and uh, this was pushed very um, hard by the, uh, the current Prime Minister uh, Suga. And um, I think we are very hopeful that this um, agency is um, uh, altering the status quo. Um, the minister Hirai he devoted his political career in this uh, area, considering that there were previous um, ministers who didn't really use computers. That this is a, a great, uh, the right person to actually lead this um, initiative. He uses keywords like government as a startup and trying to uh, really challenge uh, the change in the Japanese society. Uh, they have three pillars, uh, including. Uh, updating of government services, but also digitization of the society as a whole, um, focusing on healthcare, education, and disaster management. Um, the, I think the very e e challenge uh, this agency has is that it has um, recruited talents from private sector. Uh, 100 people out of uh, 600 employees are from private sector, which is very rare in, in, in Japan. And also, um, they, it's notable that they are at a very high level of management. Uh, chief architect or CEO or CPO, uh, CPO are all from private sector. And also, um, 
it is um, interesting that we have also director general level uh, from private sector, uh, which means that uh, actual decision making could be done by the uh, uh, private sector uh, people. So, uh, but the last week, um, Prime Minister Suga uh, announced it's his stepping down from uh, the, uh, the administration. And still I'm very hopeful that and optimistic that this uh, organization will succeed in the future uh, because it has authority and momentum and support from the private sector and, and citizens at the moment. And also oh, most of the potential successors, uh, as I see the names, are likely to support the agency. Uh, one candidate uh, I'm, I'm uh, concerned about is uh, Sanae Takaichi-san, uh, who actually mentioned using my number um, to, to tax the rich people, which might again cause the controversy of use of uh, personal information in Japan. And that might be uh, one factor that could stall this um, movement. But otherwise, I think uh, I, I'm very uh, looking forward to developments of this, this uh, transformation. And one also caveat that I wanted to mention is that um, during this creation of new agency, uh, two aspects were not prioritized. One is cybersecurity. That doesn't mean that this um, agency doesn't concern uh, cybersecurity, but uh, similar to, to, to the digital systems developments, cybersecurity uh, management in Japan, Japanese government is very fragmented in, in many uh, agencies and also ministries. And this was left um, as it is. Um, and I think this has to be sorted out in the near future. And also, um, if you see the um, new agency's website, you will also uh, only probably see one page of English uh, website page. Uh, I think global interaction and um, uh, how to ex connect with the global other countries' um, agencies will be one of the uh, issues that um, the new agency has to work on. Um, otherwise, I'm very looking forward to, to this transformation. And um, uh, this is all from me. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jun. That's... Um... It's a big change for Japan. Maybe we'll get rid of fax machines finally and all the paperwork that we have to do with hard copy signatures and everything, as we, we all know when we deal with our Japanese colleagues. Um, moving right on to Yuki Tatsumi, and we'll come back for questions later. I'll just remind everybody to put their questions in the Q&A um, function in Zoom, and we'll get to those in the discussion. Over to you, Yuki. Thanks, Shiro, and uh, thank you, um, for Australian National University for giving me this opportunity. And uh, I very much enjoyed the um, June's uh, presentation about digital agency because that is actually the new agency that I was very curious about how it's going to evolve. So sounds like uh, this is very much of a work in progress. So I'm very much looking forward to continue to watch the uh, evolution of this agency. But uh, my task here tonight, um, this evening in DC, DC time, but then um, for your afternoon is to uh, talk a little bit about the uh, challenges for Japanese defense policy, both existing and the uh, um, upcoming. So here is, um, I would like to do three things in my uh, limited time for the uh, opening remarks. And I'm very much looking forward to um, um, receiving a Q and A uh, and, and the, uh, continue the conversation afterwards. So first I would like to um, identify a couple of things um, that are considered, that Japan considers as a major challenge for its defense policy. I'm mainly taking hints from the uh, latest defense white paper that was published in early August. And then I think I would highlight a couple of things uh, when it comes to how um, Japan's uh, defense establishment is uh, thinking about how to cope with the emergence, emergence of the uh, new technology such as artificial intelligence, big data, and so forth. Secondly, I would actually like to talk a little bit about the, uh, spend a little bit more time about the um, 
impact that could um, of a current political uncertainty following uh, Prime Minister Suga's um, announcement of um, his um, stepping down as of uh, this past weekend on to uh, Japan's defense policy. And um, I would like to finish up my remarks by uh, identifying a couple of the uh, mile markers to watch as uh, moving forward for the next uh, three to six months. So moving right on, um, let me talk a little bit about the uh, how Japan uh, identifies its uh, defense policy challenges. Um, and then again, um, my hand, um, I take this uh, hints from the uh, latest defense flight paper that was uh, that was uh, published in the uh, August one and I would like to mention that uh, now full um, English translation is available on the uh, um, Japanese Ministry of Defense's website which is actually kind of unheard of because um, they used to have a at least several month delay in coming up with uh, English translation. So this is a major step forward. And I actually would like to congratulate JMOD's um, efforts to uh, pushing out their information on the uh, public domain. Uh, one thing that I would like to note is from the uh, 2021 defense white paper is that uh, China features big as Tokyo's top security cons concern. And if you just, if you, even if you only read the introduction that was written by um, incumbent Defense Minister Nobuo Kishi, um, he started out by, he starts out um, his introduction to the Defense White Paper by referring to Beijing's, quote, unilateral attempts to change the status quo in East, East and uh, South China Seas, unquote, particularly emphasizing the uh, problematic um, aspect of a Chinese uh, Coast Guard law enacted in February 2021. And obviously for Japan, um, North Korea's uh, nuclear program and ballistic missile program is a major security concern. So that does follow closely as a uh, security challenge as the uh, security challenges top um, item that the Japan continues to keep a close tab on. And um, this year's um, defense white paper also reiterates Japan's commitment to the uh, promoting uh, free and open in the Pacific concept. And one thing I would like to note is that the importance is that it places on the uh, security cooperation between bilateral US, not just um, bilateral U.S.-Japan alliance, but beyond the uh, this bilateral alliances, namely um, India, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, Germany, UK, and France. Um, and uh, that is actually a major shift. Um, I think um, Japan has talked about the uh, active uh, uh, reaching out to uh, other security partners um, in the um, in beyond the uh, U.S. Japan alliance, but I don't think um, I don't think any past white paper has discussed the uh, security cooperation outside of the uh, in outside of the uh, Indo-Pacific partners, such as European partners, um, to the to this to this degree. And uh, in that context, I would also like to note that, that there, this white paper attracted a quite bit of attention because it did articulate Japan's um, interest in the uh, stability of the uh, cross Taiwan relations and the importance that it has on the uh, Japan's own security. And uh, this is actually the very first time that uh, Japan's defense white paper discussed this in, in such a clear and unambiguous term. So this is one thing to note. And uh, obviously uh, the United States and the alliance with the United States is the utmost importance for Japan's uh, defense, defense policy. So it does uh, emphasize the uh, continued focus on the robust US-Japan alliance and defense cooperation in that context. And um, just um, an addendum, um, on August 31st, um, Japan's Ministry of Defense has released the uh, new budget request for the uh, upcoming F, um, fiscal year 2022 through 2023 um, budget request. And this is actually a quite a big sea change because it does have a 7% increase from last year's uh, requested amount. And that I think is the biggest increase um, that I've seen in this uh, request amount, um, at least in the last 
10 years, and I really haven't personally could recall the um, such a big increase in the um, percentage uh, compared to the uh, previous year. Now, um, I would like to note, um, given the uh, current situation in the uh, in the Japan's Japanese government's response in the uh, COVID-19 and the uh, spread of the Delta variants and uh, so many things that the Japan has been actually quite falling behind in terms of uh, rolling out of vaccinations and so forth. This could, um, this um, 7% increase um, may not um, hold depending on the negotiation that uh, Ministry of Defense uh, will have with the uh, Ministry of Finance. But I just would like to know that um, Ministry of Defense uh, did request this much a big of an increase compared to previous year and that is very actually noteworthy and under this new um new uh, budget request space um cyber and electric magnetics uh, gets the uh, lot of attention on this budget um but um speaking to the uh, theme of this panel, uh, which is the uh, emerging technology and digitalization, digitalization of the economy, and how Japan might or might not be able to cope with the emerging technologies. Um, quite frankly, um, Japan's Ministry of Defense really has, still hasn't quite figured out how how to do or what to do with the uh, AI and the uh, other emerging technologies, but they at least began in this budget request um, put uh, put in the uh, kind of a placeholder to begin um, studies of how to incorporate those things into the uh, defense capability. However, all these things could be actually a significant impact, could be uh, influenced um, either positively or negatively, depending on how current uh, political uncertainty will shake out. Um, as um, as all of us know, um, September, um, Prime Minister Suga announced that he would not seek elect re-election as the liberal de ruling the de Liberal Democratic Party's president. What that means is he would step down on September 30th as his uh, term as the LDP president expires. And now LDP has to uh, pick a new president. And then I think um, we have seen a f flurry of speculation and speculative reports on um, who's going to be running, who would support whom, and uh, who might be the uh, top candidate to uh, challenge whom and uh, all that sort of things. But what even complicates the picture is the um, Jap Japanese House of Representatives, lower house election needs to happen after because it um, sometime in the fall because um, its uh, term expires on August 22nd. So original plan before um, Suga's announcement of uh, not seeking re-election and stepping down is that LDP would hold its own presidential election within September and depending on the results, um, there may, may or may not uh, be a change in a prime minister, very a caretaker government, uh, quite possible. And uh, LDP will go into the upcoming uh, lower house election with the new phase or same phase, depending on how the uh, presidential election would have shaken out and lower, lower house election would have happened in uh, October. But now there is, a, there is a great deal of uncertainty on when actually the, this uh, lower house election will take place. Uh, some uh, media reports speculates that uh, it may actually um, bleeds into November beyond the expiration of the uh, current terms of the uh, diet, which will be the first, uh, which will be the first time occurrence since the uh, Japan's current uh, parliamentary democracy system started. So that will be a quite unusual event if that comes to play. Focusing back on the uh, upcoming LDP presidential election, um, everybody kind of thought that uh, former foreign minister, um, Kishida was, uh, the, was going to be the top contender for the position. 
but since uh, the announcement of a prime minister stepping down, there were all kinds of a maneuvering going on. And the uh, most recent uh, formula is the um, is that the um, maybe there will be a coalition between a couple of a uh, couple of groups to uh, push. Uh, popular uh, minister, uh, foreign minister and current admin uh, reform minister uh, Taro Kono um, into the uh, position. So we'll see that happens. But um, so all that political maneuver could Im quite impact how this uh, defense budget holds and uh, what the uh, Japan's uh, foreign, pl um, foreign pl policy, policy and security pl policy priority is going to be. So quickly wrapping up, a um, couple of uh, mile, marker watch, mile markers to watch. So obviously, who will succeed Suga as a prime minister is the biggest, uh, the biggest uh, topic of interest. But then following that, what his or her cabinet will look like, especially who would fill the position of foreign minister, defense minister, and the uh, because we're talking about uh, digital economy and technology here, um, minister of um, Minister of Economic, Economy, Trade and Industry will, will be. And obviously the uh, uh, results of upcoming uh, full uh, lower house election slated to happen either bet sometime between uh, late October around Halloween times through the uh, early November. So depending on that, um, the personality that holds those offices and the results of the election could really impact, um, not really necessarily impact the uh, um, defense budget and the uh, general trend that the Japan set itself, but um, uh, nuances and, uh, and the prioritization of among those items could change. So I will wrap it up as that. Thank you, Shiro. Back to you. Thanks so much, Yuki. Yeah, look, it all comes down to the Prime Minister still and, and the, the uncertainty there, and, and that's exactly where Jun left off. Um, so I look forward to coming back to a lot of those issues too, especially on the, the kind of placeholder on artificial intelligence and these new issues. But let's hope the next um, presentation, the next issue doesn't depend so much on who becomes Prime Minister, but we'll, we'll hear from Llewellyn on that. So uh, now on energy transition and sort of innovation policy there, I'll hand over to Llewellyn. Thanks, Shiro. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, let me uh, also uh, recognise uh, the Wurundjeri people whose land uh, I am uh, on down here in Melbourne and uh, recognise their uh, elders um, past and uh, emerging. Uh, so I've been asked to uh, talk a little bit about uh, what's going on with Japan's energy and climate policy. Um, of course, there's going to be a lot of interesting questions about what the, uh, what, what, what the uh, decision by the current uh, Prime Minister uh, Suga Yoshihide to uh, not run as the LD for president and therefore no longer be the uh, leader of Japan, what that means across different policy areas and particularly within the energy and climate space. And, um, you know, it's, it's particularly germane uh, in this uh, area of policy because, uh, you know, the, the current Prime Minister has actually had an enormous impact on uh, Japan's energy and climate policy. You know, for those of you who have followed uh, Japanese policymaking uh, politics in Japan, you know, there used to be a, a, a kind of, um, uh, you know, one would typically assume that a change in the prime minister wouldn't have a significant effect uh, on, on policy. Um, because most policy is being developed within ministries and agencies and a fairly technocratic bottom-up kind of process. But uh, in the short but very sweet period of the uh, Suga administration, I think we clearly uh, have seen a different uh, model for uh, developing uh, energy and climate policy coming out of the government of Japan. And that has led to some very significant uh, announcements uh, which have been made. Uh, so I'll just want to review this very quickly. And then, um, you know, uh, like all good academics, I believe that uh, good things come in threes. And so I'm going to give you an argument. And my argument is going to be that Suga, uh, uh, as prime minister, um, has uh, successfully managed to embed uh, a number of the changes, in fact, three big changes in energy and climate policy, which mean that the changing of the prime minister is not likely to see a significant change in direction in terms of uh, Japan's climate and energy policy. In fact, if Kono Taro uh, becomes prime minister, I see um, upside 
uh, in terms of more rapid energy transition. Uh, firstly, uh, just to note um, that the, the Japan's energy and climate policy has really been under shifting grounds over the last uh, uh, little less than a year. Um, uh, as you can see here, uh, Prime Minister Suga used actually his first uh, major speech to the Japanese parliament to announce a 2050 economy-wide greenhouse gas net zero announcement. And in the case of Japan, unlike, for example, Australia, that basically means uh, you, the use of energy and energy conversion. Uh, about nine out of every 10 uh, units of uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, come from the energy sector as opposed to, let's say, agriculture. So, uh, you know, we're really talking about energy transition when we talk about a net zero uh, goal for, uh, for Japan. Um, uh, in addition, uh, in December 2020, we've seen the green growth strategy. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, we've also seen some discussions about carbon pricing and border uh, carbon adjustments, and I, I'm happy to talk about that in Q&A as well if you want an update on where that stands. And then most importantly uh, for me, in April 2021, 20, uh, we've seen that mid-century net zero target uh, shifted forward in time uh, in a way that influences investment decisions today. And that's happened uh, because of uh, the announcement of a 46% uh, greenhouse gas emissions reduction target by 2030 relative to 2013. That's very, very ambitious. Uh, if you look um, at uh, the, the previous goal, uh, for example, which was enshrined um, in, uh, in Japan's uh, nationally determined contribution uh, to the, uh, the U United Nations Framework uh, on Convention on Climate Change, it committed Japan to a 26% reduction in emissions by 2030 relative to 2013, something that Japan was on track to achieve. So this is a substantial increase in near-term ambition focused particularly on the energy sector. So some really, really big changes. Uh, I, I don't have time to go into this now, but one of the big things that's happened in decision making is essentially Japan has adopted what's called a backcasting method. And what that really means is establishing an ambitious target and then innovating to achieve it, rather than looking at what's possible now and then uh, thinking about how you might inc incrementally improve upon that. And you've seen that play out in, for example, uh, renewable energy, uh, uh, renewable electricity targets and how those have changed over the last over the last few months. So I said, uh, you know, we've only got a little time. I said there were three reasons why I think that the Suga administration has successfully embedded uh, or is in the process of successfully embedding this new uh, ambition in climate and energy policy within Japan's policy making landscape in a way that will mean it will outlive his administration. The first of those uh, is because of Japan's nationally determined contribution. Now, this is something, uh, for those of you who don't follow um, uh, international uh, climate policy making, essentially a commitment which uh, governments uh, around the world um, uh, have committed to make uh, to, uh, as part of the framework convention, which, um, you know, where they state what that, the ambition uh, of, of the government will be. And the idea is to ratchet those up over time. In fact, in 2020, uh, Japan reiterated its previous target, but that um, is now in the process of changing. And as you can see in front of you, uh, the, the new uh, nationally determined contribution, which is an international commitment and therefore really does kind of lock J uh, the Japanese government in uh, after Prime Minister Suga, uh, incorporates this much more ambitious target in the languages in front of you here. That is to roughly half Japan's emissions relative to 2013 by 2030. Now, this NDC is currently under a domestic public comments process. Uh, it finishes on the 4th of October. And so once that's been completed and we have kind of social license around this number, I expect Japan to submit this and to have this uh, in in incorporated as its new international commitment. That's a, that's a big change. The, the second uh, reason um, that uh, I, I think that uh, this new uh, ambition around climate and energy policy will outlive the Suga administration is because of something called the Basic Energy Plan. Japan has a law called the Basic Energy Law. It was put in place uh, in 2001 and it requires the cabinet to review Japan's midterm energy policy settings every three years. The last one uh, was done in uh, 2018, which means that uh, we are reviewing it again this year. And just in July, actually, 
uh, the, the full draft of that document uh, was released. And as you can see here, it shows a significant increase in renewables uh, deployment as a target relative to the previous target. That is about a 14% increase in generated electricity relative to uh, the 2030 target. And that is met by a, a reduction of 7% in uh, electricity generated by coal and a reduction of 7% of electricity generated by gas. I think that as we move towards this, it's safe to say that uh, Japanese demand for Australian thermal coal and Japanese demand for Australian uh, natural gas in the electricity sector have peaked. And so we are going to see that gradually decline over time. But a key point is that, again, the draft basic energy plan is currently under a public comments process. That process will also be completed uh, by the 4th of October. It takes about a month for those to be collated. So I expect uh, the basic energy plan to be approved by cabinet and therefore locked in. Uh, moving uh, beyond the Suga administration. The third reason I think that uh, Japan's new ambition, which we have uh, Prime Minister Suga uh, to thank for, uh, is because of its green innovation plan. Japan's developed a very comprehensive set of sectoral plans um, across different segments of the economy. Those are show shown for you here um, to kind of celebrate the Australian government putting its own offshore wind power uh, uh, legis uh, legislation to Parliament last uh, last week, which will see us build an offshore wind uh, sector as well. It's worth noting that one of the key areas in which Japan is really uh, pushing is in offshore wind. Uh, it has, for example, a deployment goal of 20, uh, up to 45 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2040, with about a gigawatt or about four projects a year, every year moving forward. And we're about to find the results of those. Uh, this kind of planning is at a very detailed um, stage. If you look at offshore, for example, we've got uh, industry targets around domestic content. Uh, we've got supply chain development uh, and so on and so forth. And this kind of sectoral industry policy planning around energy transition is in place across each of those 14 sectors, which I described to you a moment uh, ago. So uh, both in terms of the NDC uh, also, the uh, public comments process around Japan's basic energy plan, which will be improved by cabinet, and because the sectoral plans around energy transition are already in place, that provides strong evidence to me that uh, whatever um, we see from the next administration, there's going to be significant continuity in this new ambition uh, that we've seen from the Japanese government. Uh, let me just finish. Uh, by uh, saying um, uh, saying uh, uh, just uh, one comment about the the implications of this for Australia, this is a really significant change. Okay, Aust uh, Japan has been uh, a, a partner for Australia in the development of Australia's uh, resources, particularly around gas, but also around coal. Um, but it's clear that Japanese energy markets are increasingly policy driven. That is, it's not the underlying economics necessarily of fuels which is driving uh, their use, but rather uh, this ambition around energy transition and these very detailed plans which are being put in place. And that means that for Australia, intelligence about those changes, what are the policy instruments, when are they being put in place by, what does that mean for Australian demand, and what are the new opportunities um, that we're seeing, for example, in green ammonia, but I think in many other areas as well. Uh, and how might we take advantage of those? One of the arguments I've been making is that we need some uh, better uh, platforms around track uh, 1.5 and track 2 uh, uh, discussions to enable us to better chart what will be a shared uh, energy future in energy transition between Australia and Japan. Let me stop there. Look forward to the discussion. Great. Thanks so much, Llewellyn. And <clears throat> thank you for keeping to time for all three speakers. I might get um, June and Yuki to reveal themselves and turn their cameras on. Um, and we've got some questions in the Q&A uh, and a few questions that have been answered already by our speakers. So look, let me just start with uh, the political uncertainty and, and the now jockeying for Prime Minister, because all three of you raised that, and that is a, a topic that we're all you know, watching very closely. Llewellyn, you mentioned um, with a possible Prime Minister Kono, that um, this 
energy transition, the commitments might be accelerated. Uh, maybe I'll just ask you to run through a couple of the other candidates, Llewellyn, and then I'll get to Yuki and Jun too, of the prospects for you know, energy transition with the other candidates, say Kishida and, and co. Uh, and then obviously, Yuki, to yourself, you said, you know, change in nuance and emphasis um, a bit, but uh, if you could uh, flesh that out a bit, including there's a question in here about um, a female candidate that's, that's also running. And then Jun, um, uh, just a, a quick commentary on the, the potential impact of the leading candidates. Sure. Um, so my understanding is, although you've got to kind of read the paper every morning and I haven't had a chance to do that, that, the, that currently the, the, the only formally uh, committed uh, member of the LDP to run in the presidential election is uh, Mr. Uh, Kichida. And um, that we, uh, you know, are seeing lots of uh, jockeying, but it's not yet clear, for example, how uh, Asotaro or others uh, within the LDP are going to line up and what that might mean for uh, eventually other candidates revealing their hands. The, the reason that I say um, uh, uh, Mr. Um, uh, Kono provides a lot of upside if you want to see uh, energy transition uh, is because of his role, uh, firstly, as the Minister of Defence uh, in previous cabinet, and then as the Minister for um, Administrative Reform. In both those portfolios, he has demonstrated himself to be very bullish on the potential role of renewable electricity within Japan's energy system. Uh, when he was Minister of Defence, he played a key role in ensuring um, that uh, developers of onshore wind in particular uh, were able to coordinate well with the Ministry of Defence around radar issues. Because um, you know, when you have significant numbers of turbines within the uh, range of radars, uh, which Japan has, particularly on the Japan Sea side, uh, that that um, that those turbines can interfere with the performance of those radars. When he was Ministry of Defence, he played a key role really in helping ensure that uh, that coordination has been has been done well. Also for the offshore wind sector, as as Minister for Administrative Reform, he set up a renewables task task force, which essentially he's been using to uh, make recommendations to different ministries, uh, MLIT, the Ministry of Land and Infrastructure Transport, uh, METI uh, and others um, about how uh, more quickly um, you uh, might see, um, you know, what regulatory reforms are needed in order to more quickly deploy renewables. Uh, Mr. Kishida has said some things, but, um, but is, you know, if you look at his policy platform, it's much, le much less front and center. He has noted that, um, you know, energy system reliability requires continued use of coal. Uh, he um, has done some things within the LDP when, uh, when he was the um, chairman of the Policy Affairs Research Council, uh, just in terms of organizing how policy gets made within the LDP. But there's much less known about the other potential candidates on that score. Thanks, Llewellyn. Uh, Yuki? Yes, thank you for that great question. Um, so, and a conventional wisdom is that uh, Kishida, it, former Minister Kishida, is the uh, leading um, leading uh, candidate to uh, succeed uh, Prime Minister Suga. But um, like Llewellyn said, that uh, Llewellyn alluded to, there was so much uh, movement um, behind the scene going on right now, and I am very closely watching whether um, Taro Kono will formally announce his candidacy before the end of this week because um, another uh, top contender or in at least in the in the uh, in the uh, uh, field of a uh, public opinion um, Mr. Kishida is actually ranks um, the third as the uh, person who public would like to see as the next prime minister. So number one is Taro Kono, and the second, number number two, is a, she, a former defense minister, Shigeru Ishiba. So there has been a whirlwind of speculation that perhaps uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Ishiba might not might choose not to run and then rather bring all of his supporters to support uh, Mr. Kono's candidacy and to accelerate the uh, generational change and then also address the uh, kind of existing and uh, brewing frustration within the LDP of the, uh, um, I guess, a diplomatic speaking, not so inclusive uh, decision-making processes that, um, that unfolded um, under Prime Minister, um, former Prime Minister Abe and, they, and now under a Prime Minister Suga. So 
all um, all I'm saying is the uh, um, I don't think any one of us um, here today has a crystal ball on how it all shakes out. But um, regardless of who gets um, who gets elected, um, it could be a very short lived um, prime ministership. Depend because the uh, lower house election uh, f- follows very very shortly after the uh, LDP presidency. So if LDP doesn't do well in that election, um, whoever sits on the top uh, will be uh, held accountable. So we'll just have to see. And then I'm just afraid. I mean, I just pray that uh, Japan will not devolve back into the uh, 2007 after uh, Mr. Abe stepped down, where we see different prime minister every year. Because um, now is exact. Now is exactly not the time that the Japan can afford to have that kind of unstable leadership. Thanks, Yuki. And we'll we'll come back to this issue in the next panel, of course, as well. Um, and to you, Jun, um, specifically on the prospects of different candidates for, you know, affecting this really whole of society digital transformation that Japan needs to undertake. Right. Uh, just a little bit little comments on digital policies. Um, I think uh, Fumio Kishida-san uh, has been in the same faction as uh, Hirai uh, minister, digital minister. So I think uh, if uh, it becomes Kishida-san, then uh, the current um, uh, move, movement will not uh, change. And also Kono-san, uh, Taro Kono and um, uh, Minister Hirai works closely together. So. I think these two candidates, uh, I, I see that they, their support in the current uh, digital transformation. Uh, Ishiba-san, uh, I'm not sure. And also uh, because uh, Sanae Takaichi-san has been a former uh, Minister of uh, Interior and also Communications, I think um, she might have different different views uh, as to digitization. So I think uh, we, we have to watch closely if, if she gets elected. And then in final comment, uh, I totally agree with uh, Yuki-san's view that um, Japan needs to, uh, uh, the next prime minister may be short-lived lived, and uh, Japan cannot afford to, to have that era back again. So um, yeah, that is my comment. Thanks, Jun. While, while we're with you, um, maybe I'll follow up um, based on your presentation and, and, you know, setting up a digital ministry and coordinating across government. Uh, it all looks really promising. And we know Japan, when it starts to implement things, can be very effective and, and quick. But Japan is rather behind, um, as you showed, with fax machines. Um, and, and on some issues, some in some areas, is way ahead of the rest of the world when it comes to technology and innovation. But it seems a lot of um, areas, you know, very slow to change. Um, and the, the prevalence of fax machines is, is a case in point. You, you answered one of the questions here um, in the Q&A um, on what the barriers are, but maybe that's worth just reflecting on for, for the rest of us. And, and for me, you know, working from home isn't all that fantastic all the time, but the occasional um, flexibility to do so, I would have thought is, um, now that it exists in Japan, do you think there are prospects for uh, workplaces to be more flexible and, and that'll help with labour force participation, you know, people commuting less, or are we going to go right back to when things open up, right back to long hours in the office, you know, staying late at night? I think the pandemic had a huge impact on how people work in Japan, and I'm hoping that 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 transition will not go back after um, everything goes to back to normal. But I think, um, for, for instance, uh, like uh, uh, the, Mr. Kono Taro, uh, he is pushing to, to, to strongly with these reforms. So uh, I think uh, depending on the leaders, <laughs> um, Japan's um, tra- trajectory will change. Uh, but definitely, I think, um, the labor force uh, is a, a huge key to 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 de- determining the, what what will the, the next steps will be for Japan. Thanks, Jim. Look, we might um 
Uh, there's a question here to Llewellyn that you said you'll answer live. I might just add to everyone, thanks for asking the questions here. And it's great that our panelists are able to answer some of these in, the, in via text. Um, it's a, trying to limit the Zoom fatigue for everyone and having short panels, but there's a, an opportunity to engage with the, the panelists while we do so. So the question is from Anonymous, how much of the energy transition is actually possible? Um, and I won't respond to the rest, of, ask the rest of the question, but you get the idea. Llewellyn. Yeah, and thanks for the question. Um, so uh, uh, this is a question um, uh, not of uh, the direction of change, but rather the pace of change. That is um, that uh, it's clear that, uh, you know, Japan um, is going to decarbonize uh, its energy system. The, the, the real question is uh, how quickly that can happen. Um, and so, uh, and I think there's lots of debate there, right? So I, th you know, I'm, uh, you know, I haven't uh, done the numbers in a, in a careful way, but but if you look at the, um, you know, the model model results of how Japan gets to net zero, for example, uh, by mid-century, it's an extremely challenging target. That's an extremely challenging target, also for really every economy, whether you're developed or developing. Um, and so, you know, uh, are there enormous challenges? Yes. Um, I think the best way to think about that problem is sectorally. Uh, and what I mean by that is when we talk about energy transition, we're actually talking about a large number of energy transitions, each of which are occurring under different time scales. If you think about how long, a, you know, a steel foundry lasts, for example, compared to a coal-fired power plant or whatever it might be, when the investment decision is made about what to do with that when it reaches the end of its operating life, that's when the key moment um, occurs. And, uh, you know, I, I, but I do see a lot of positive movement in Japan, um, more so than, than previously. One of the key issues, for example, that, that the uh, government faces is around the issue of grid, uh, the transmission grid, because renewable energy resources are not uh, in the same places often where the uh, large fixed point fossil fuel uh, intensive power generation facilities are currently in Japan. And, you know, uh, the, the country's just developed a national grid plan for the first time, um, you know, following the Europeans. And we're now seeing uh, a feasibility done, which will be uh, done with the first draft completed by the end of this year for a high voltage DC cable running from Hokkaido down to Tokyo Electric, which will enable a lot more offshore wind capacity to flow from the location where that wind is down to the major population centers. So I think that, um, you know, there are challenges. I think there are challenges about time rather than uh, about direction. And um, while, um, uh, and I see room for optimism. Thanks, Llewellyn. Yeah, and that, as you said in your presentation, the pace of that change um, is gonna affect the Australia-Japan relationship significantly and how Japan relates to the rest of the world. Um, Yuki, to you, you mentioned in your presentation, you know, that the Ministry of Defence in its latest white paper is talking about artificial intelligence and big data, but it just needs more money. And so it's going to, um, you know, go to battle with Ministry of Finance as usual to try to get that. Is this, um, you know, we, we expect Japan and Japan's self-defence forces to be at the technological frontier, really. But from what you're saying, it sounds like, you know, this is, an area where Japan's probably a little bit behind, but Ministry of Defence paying lip service to try to get some more funding. Is that, is that a fair assessment? And then I guess another question is, you know, surely space and other areas are really new frontiers for Japan and, and um, thinking about defence. And How is Japan working with countries like Australia in, in that space? Thanks, Shiro. Um, and I think the, um, rather than, I think um, paying, just paying a lip service is um, a little bit too harsh on the uh, Ministry of Defense. Rather, I would characterize it as um, they're just about to begin to grapple with the uh, magnitude of the change that those technologies might bring in to the way that they conceptualize uh, what the defense, like a defense operations and different um, self-defense force operation might look like. And then on top of it, how uh, Japan will capitalize on its existing technology within the country, but, you know, let alone cooperating with the uh, U.S. and the other security partners such as Australia. So we will see how much of a budget for a study that the uh, Ministry of Defense might able to uh, sneak, um, snatch um, 
based on this uh, budget request. But um, they are, I mean, based on the conversation that I've had with my friends over there, um, they are quite serious about um, these uh, new technologies and how to, um, how to, they are keenly aware that uh, they need to address these challenges. But I think um, the uh, source of the challenge comes from twofold. And uh, first, uh, first and foremost, uh, most of those advanced technology lives in private sector and, the, and not in the uh, national defense circles. And the, uh, traditionally speaking, and I think I would love to uh, hear uh, uh, what June might have to say about the uh, current trend, but the uh, scientific um, R&D um, R &D world is, um, has been known um, historically very, very adverse to uh, support national security related um, research and a materialization of those um, technologies into actual um, defense systems. So if that, um, if that trend continues, then uh, Ministry of Defense really have a limited in-country resources to pull it from. So I don't know what that implication might look like, but um, I'll just throw it out and then I would love to uh, get uh, Jun's opinions on that. Thanks, Yuki. And that's exactly what I want to ask Jun as well, because there's a question here from Jennifer Jacket on strategic rivalry over advanced technology you know, between the United States and China and, and where Japan really fits into this with um, sensitive technology protection. And, and I'll talk a little bit about this um, outside of the technology realm, but um, more generally in the next panel. Um, but on this issue, you know, Japan is the third largest R&D spender in the world. Um, a lot of that's in the private sector. Junior showed that um, the new digital agencies bring people in from the private sector. And that's where all the, the dynamism and the innovation is. Um, how does Japan see this being squeezed between the United States and China in this space? And are you, are you worried about that for development of, of technology in Japan, um, as, as well as the, the push for digitalization more broadly? Yes, I think a uh, paradigm is shifting very quickly in Japanese uh, government and also in the private sector because uh, previously, private sector was just private sector, just thinking about their uh, global economy and in pursuing their interests. But um, the recent China-US um, uh, conflict or the, the, that context, um, Japanese government is uh, urgently building its capabilities to 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 uh, tackle um, uh, uh, national security from an economics perspective. So uh, I think private sector is certainly concerned, but at the moment, I think they haven't found the right uh, path to actually balance the political aim and also the, the development of this technology and, and building their markets and, and profits. So I think this is one of the, the, the most focused area for the Japanese government in the next few years. Um, and also just mentioning about Yuki-san's uh, point about Japanese uh, uh, universities and, and research centers uh, reluctant to, to, to contribute to the, uh, the um, defense industry. I think this context hasn't been changed. Uh, even I think Ms. Prime Minister Suga's um, uh, this not appointing uh, people in the, the, the new um, uh, academic uh, circle has also sparked this uh, conflict. So I, I think this trend hasn't changed. So Japanese government has a difficult uh, issues to manage um, going forward. Thanks, June. And, and we've um, run out of time for this panel, but we will continue some of this discussion in the next panel, um, which is half an hour away, including trying to get this balance right that June talked about between uh, economic interests and national security. Um, but I think, you know, that was a fascinating panel for me, um, talking about Japan at the forefront or not of technology in some areas, uh, the challenges that lie ahead, you know, the energy transition still, um, you know, taking advantage of the, the COVID pandemic and what that's meant for being able to work from home whether that's just a temporary blip or whether we can really take advantage of that in Japan. Um, and then again, on the defense issues. And um, um, thank you to our panelists very much for bringing some light to these topics uh, and for answering all these questions in the Q&A. So we're gonna keep this room open. We're not gonna lose you as we did last time between sessions. The Q&A is still there. You can have a look at some of the answers, uh, but let me take this opportunity on behalf of everyone 
to thank our three panelists, Llewellyn Hughes, Yuki Tatsumi, and Jun Okoyama. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>